can I start again? I just definitely burped. <laughs> okay, well you ask me the question and then we'll start again and I'll try um, not to make noise. <laughs> what did I just say then? Oh Shit, yeah. Your career, okay, I'm yeah. Sorry. So when I was seven, um, I had meningitis. I was rushed to hospital. I was pumped full of antibiotics, uh, which my mum believes saved my life. I was in intensive care for a week and then came home straight away. Um, <laughs> I was in for a school photo uh, the week after I'd had meningitis. Um, so it was, it was a fairly quick thing for me, a quick recovery. I don't remember a lot of it, but it was obviously quite traumatic for my family. <laughs> we thought I'd made a full recovery, um, but I hadn't. As a year later, my kidneys began to fail. And then the year following that, I was diagnosed with ME, um, which has kind of taken up most of my teenage life um, because I've been unable to do sort of normal things. Um, and I very much live with the after effects to this day. The impact of having meningitis and its after effects um, was quite huge for me. I was unable to attend a mainstream school for my whole teenage years, uh, which obviously had a real impact on uh, friendships, uh, as when you're, when you're a teenager, you can't ex or a young teenager, you can't expect people to sort of stay your friend if you're out of sight. I couldn't really leave the house for any extended period of time and when I did I was in a wheelchair so I kind of needed someone to push me. So obviously it was quite an isolated time for me, um, I was obviously very unwell, I had a big in impact on my friends, my family, um, my mum had to give up work to become sort of my full time carer and I was home tutored a lot. I think to be honest it was a traumatic experience for everyone, um, including the local community I'd say, in terms of like the panic that goes around when you hear the word meningitis. In terms of friendships, I obviously have a really good few friends who stuck by me and I'm still friends with them to this day. Uh, but it's very sort of, um, it's, it's very difficult for people to get their head around because obviously I wasn't in school. This was in all in year seven when you're just about making those friendships. Everyone's talking about the favorite bands on the favorite TV and I was sort of lay in a bed in a fairly dark room for most of my teenage years. Um, so obviously I was a bit out of it. It's pretty impossible really to expect the friendships to last. But I did have, I have quite a lot of friends who um, have the same illnesses or have had the same experiences as me. That was a really kind of confidence building experience for me as well because I had people who knew what it was like to go through what I'd been through. It's very hard to explain to someone who is completely well what it's like um, to always feel unwell. Um, and I've had this kind of experience that's very independent, individual to you. And I, I, th I think just being different was probably was probably the um, main struggle. Um, so at university, it, it's I'd say it's still a struggle. Um, it's having a chronic illness, especially um, because you're having to balance being well with being ill, with living your life, with getting your grades in. I think that being in the middle ground between being ill and well is probably sometimes harder than being completely ill or completely well. And often the people at uni don't have that perspective um, and they don't have the background of what's happened to you, trying to explain why you can't go on a night out or why you're leaving the night out a bit early without being seen as, as crazy or, or very different. And I have a group of really supportive friends who understand that if I have to go home after a night out, there's a really good level of understanding there. Um, but obviously you have to work for that and there'll be people who think you're just over exaggerating, I'm sure. <laughs> so my sister is a few years younger than me. She's always been nothing but supportive to me um, since she came home. Like even when she was sort of 10, 11, um, and her friends came home and were noisy and I was feeling ill, she'd, that she'd be the one to tell them to be quiet. She always runs to the shops by me and <laughs> buy me snacks when I'm sad and ill. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure it will have had an effect on her because obviously she was very young. I was probably getting a lot more of the attention, which when you're, when you're young is hard to comprehend. Like, like I say, um, she's never been anything but supportive to me, like pushing my wheelchair down hills and things. <laughs> we were put in touch with someone who, who was already in touch with meningitis now. And we were then put in contact with Chris Hughes, who's the support officer in the Northwest. And since then, it was probably about 10, 11 years ago, we've had Chris and, Chris and meningitis now in our lives. I have had counselling, art therapy. I've had, obviously, Chris's support, which has been sort of invaluable to us all. And I, I think just generally the, the existence of meningitis now is quite a like, 
channel of support because it means that you know someone's there if you do need anything and I think that's comforting in itself. <laughs> I'd say the counselling was very sort of um, important to me uh, and kind of helped me to make sense of what had happened. It was it was after a bereavement to do with meningitis. I, I think it was good to sort of talk talk through everything that had happened. My meningitis experience had been quite long um, and I'd never really wanted any involvement with it. I'd sort of, meningitis was the thing that caused the rest of the things. So it was good to sort of come come to terms with what had happened to me really, because obviously I was very, very young. Um, so it was good to talk everything through and just uh, try and make, make sense of things in my head, I think. The idea of counselling can be um, a bit scary, but obviously I'm a big advocate. I think the one I went to, it was very, it was a nice calming room. <laughs> it wasn't a kind of scary woman or, um, she was very calming. It was a very neutral setting as well, so you wouldn't, have, it didn't have a big uh, sign saying counselling on the outside. It's sort of going talk about yourself for a few hours, uh, but it, it was a very non-judgmental atmosphere. As I've grown a bit older, I've sort of required it a bit less, probably due to the, the previous things I've had, and I've kind of focused more on uh, giving back, but Chris has always remained a real support for me, as have sort of the team at Menjai Now head office as well. Even to me now, feeling involved as a therapy. <laughs> I've attended quite a few Meningitis Now events, um, including Family Days, which I think are really great uh, sort of opportunities to meet other people who've had meningitis and experience different things. I think we can all sort of learn from each other um, and create an, a big support network there uh, without the formalities of uh, sort of having Meningitis Now put it into place, which I think is very good. And it's nice for me as well to be able to give that sort of as a <laughs> old timer <laughs> um, to be able to give that support to people who might just be going through it. I'd say meeting other people has made an incredibly positive impact on me. I have a whole group of friends who completely understand um, and I might not have I might not have to speak to them all the time but I, I know that they're at the end of a message or a phone call if I do want want to speak to them or and I know that they'll have that deeper level of understanding than other people. It, it's just nice to feel understood every now and then. <laughs> So I met Alex Williams at a family day in 2012. I think like many other people who met him, I was <laughs> sort of taken by him <laughs> pretty soon after meeting him and we hit it off really well. But really more more than all this sort of inspirational like thing that he's got going on, which he was, um, he was he was just my friend and I think that's what I needed at that point. Like his inf influence on my life and his impact was pretty huge because he, he sort of taught me that it was okay to have bad days but to keep on keep on keeping on and that if, if I wanted to do something I could set my mind to it. I think the Believe and Achieve programme itself is such a, a, a really great thing to come from meningitis now. It's not just for people who've had meningitis, it's for their siblings too. And I think that sort of even them having a support network, it can offer them guidance in terms of what they're going to do with their careers. I think the impact it could have is giving someone a real chance after something so sort of traumatic happens. And I think especially the buddying scheme, getting to know other people, uh, will be really invaluable. I think meningitis now and my involvement with the charity has definitely shaped what I want to do uh, in terms of my career. The skills I think I've de developed from the support I've had, I think definitely sort of being empathetic uh, to other people, I think meeting people at family days has given me sort of a wide, wide range of experiences to learn from um, and I can take those with me and sort of tell other people about them. It's given me the confidence I need to kind of do what I want. It was actually f through um, someone who worked in PR and comms at Meningitis Now that I decided I wanted to do it, um, especially for the third sector. It's really given me that sense of like direction, I think. It's given me so many great opportunities. I've spoken at Parliament, given talks at sort of big law firms. Yeah, just overall. Like Meningitis Now is very special to me. It's been a very big part of my life for quite a long time. But it's nice that I'm able to sort of do those things as part of, like, alongside my life now, which is 